I'm gonna start out by thanking everyone for joining us for the 2022 Governor's Small Business Series. I hope that you have gotten something out of this. I know I did. Thank goodness my husband brought his notepad because we took some notes on funding opportunities and uh, various things that we learned in the sessions. All right, on behalf of the Lubbock community, it is a pleasure to see this forum come to fruition. After months of planning with our Office of the Governor, the Texas Workforce Commission, and the Overton Hotel and Conference Center. For those of you just joining us, the Office of the Governor is hosting small business forums across the great state of Texas to provide local business owners access to valuable information on workforce development, training grants, expanding markets, and other business growth opportunities. Through regional collaboration and hundreds of community business and educational organizations throughout Texas, the Governor's Small Business Forums are one way that businesses can come together and learn from one another. Now please help me to thank our partners for their support of the event. We've got two partners, the Texas Workforce Commission, and we also wanna thank the Overton Hotel and Conference Center and all of the staff for getting all the food and the coffee and the drinks and all the cleanup. Um, I know that that's a tough job, so let's put a hand together to thank these folks. Now, I also want to thank our vendor partners. This is a pretty long list, but it's a distinguished one. The Northwest Texas SBDC, the TWC Engagement and Community Outreach, US SBA, West Texas District, Workforce Solutions, South Plains, Texas Department of Insurance, is that o Oshkon? Texas Department of Insurance Workers' Compensation, Texas Veterans Commission, City of Lubbock Purchasing, Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses, Dallas College, Go Texan, Texas Department of Agriculture, U.S. Department of Labor, Texas Tech Innovation Hub, Texas Tech SBDC, Texas Department of Information Resources, SCORE, Caprock Business Finance Corporation, and the People Fund. Let's put our hands together for all of these vendors. Now I would like to introduce the chairman, Brian Daniel of the Texas Workforce Commission. He's the chairman and commissioner representing the public. Brian, can I give your accolades first really quick? <laughs> Brian serves as chairman of the Texas Workforce Commission, where he works to promote and support the growth of Texas' world-class employers and talented workforce. To champion that goal, he advances innovative workforce and economic development strategies in collaboration with the TWC's education partners, local officials, and industry leaders to establish Texas's competitive edge as the best place to work in the world. Prior to joining TWC, Brian served for four and a half years on Texas Governor Greg Abbott's senior staff, where he led the Office of Economic Development and Tourism, which included the Texas Enterprise Fund, Events Trust Fund, Governor's University Research Initiative, Texas Tourism Office, Texas Music Office, Texas Film Commission, Texas Workforce Investment Council, the Economic Development Bank, the Texas Military Preparedness Commission, and the State of Texas Mexico Office. Brian's tenure as the Texas State Director for Rural Development for President George W. Bush and as Chief Administrator for Trade and Business Development at the Texas Department of Agriculture, along with his private sector experiences as a marketing executive and member of the board, of directors have provided him with valuable insights on economic development and workforce issues. Brian is a graduate of Texas Tech University, guns up, with both a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. In 2019, Texas Tech College of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources recognized Brian as a distinguished alum. Come on up, Brian. Let's give him a hand. Thank you. All right, how's everybody today? Good, we're eating lunch, we're enjoying it. Let's start with something that I'm uncomfortable about. I've worked with the government before, 
you heard a few things that I've done. Way back when, 20 something years ago, I was with USDA. It's really my first kind of leadership job. It was with the federal government, with the Department of Agriculture, and I headed up the rural development programs for the entire state of Texas. And so, you know, about a year into the job, I was feeling really good about the things we were doing. We were making progress. We were doing the things that they wanted us to do. We were getting done all the things uh, that the people were asking. The communities were, were really uh, calling on us, talking to us about our programs and really bringing us online. So I was traveling around doing a lot of speeches like this one, and I gave what I felt like was a pretty good speech. In fact, you know, it was a really good speech. I hit all the right points. We talked about all the things we came to talk about. We had a lot of things to brag about. I came down off the stage. A woman met me coming off the stage. I've learned in this job, people meeting you coming off the stage want one of two things. They, 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 want, they heard something in the speech they want to know something more about, or they have some advice for you. She was in the second category. She said, can I tell you a story? I said, yes. She says, let me tell you this story. She said, picture with me a scene in West Texas. A rancher is moving a flock of sheep from one pasture across a farm road to another pasture. It's got traffic blocked off. It's got, it's got sheep there. It's got everything working. He's moving the sheep across. They're coming out this gate. They're going in this other gate. From out of nowhere comes this suburban. It comes screeching to a halt in a cloud of dust right in front of his flock of sheep. Guy jumps out of the suburban, runs over, and he says, you the owner of these sheep? He says, yeah. He says, I bet I can tell you how many sheep are in that flock. Guy says, really? He says, yeah, but if I tell you how many sheep are in the flock, you gotta give me one of the sheep. Guy said, okay, got it. So he goes back over to the Suburban, the guy that just arrived in the cloud of dust. He pulls the back Suburban out. He rolls out this supercomputer. It's got a satellite dish. He starts communicating with satellites in the sky. And in a minute, his phone buzzes, and he looks at his phone, and he walks up to the rancher, and he says, there are 1,234 sheep in your flock. And the rancher said, that's actually pretty amazing because there are exactly 1,234 sheep in the flock. The guy says, can, so I get my sheep. He says, yeah, you can have your sheep. So the guy grabs his animal, he starts back toward the Suburban. The rancher says, hey, hold on a minute. He says, if I can tell you what you do, can I have my animal back? The guy says, sure, I mean, you'll never guess, but yeah, you can try. The guy says, you work for the federal government. He says, that's amazing. How did you know I worked for the federal government? He says, well, he said, I was out here minding my own business, doing my business, when you showed up out of nowhere uninvited invited yourself into the conversation, told me the answer to a question that I already knew the answer to, and then taxed me to do it by taking my animal. He says, that's pretty amazing. He says, you got me. That's right, I do. I work for the federal government. Ranch says, that's good. Now, can I have my border collie back? So, <clears throat> I'm always, when I'm showing up from the government, I'm always wondering, what are the people actually hearing? We've got some fun things to talk about today. Uh, I was invited, Jarvis invited me, so I, I'm not showing up uninvited. You guys, I think, are getting some incredible resources at this meeting. Like, let me tell you something, this group, Adriana Cruz and Jarvis and the whole crew at the governor's office, these guys, I mean, you wanna talk about value add. Now, they provide value for some things that are kind of going on in the state's economy. I've sat where Adriana sits, and I'll tell you, it, it, there's, no, there's no, like, actual, pressure being brought to bear on you for how many jobs get created or how many companies come here. Because you really, you, you kind of put it on yourself. Like we want the state to succeed and so we do this. And it's the same for me at the Workforce Commission except I'm looking at one thing and one thing alone. And that is every time Adriana is successful at helping a company create a job here, we need to be sure that someone can take that job. We look at that every day. I think whether you're a small business person and you, you, you are your workforce, or you are the CEO of a major corporation and you have 10,000 people working for you in Texas, I think at the end of the day, the thing that we're looking at is, is do we have people, Texans, who can do the work that we need to do for Texas to be successful? And so we look at a lot of numbers and it's a lot of economics involved with this, but at the end of the day, don't ever forget I'm gonna talk about a lot of numbers here today. Don't forget, those numbers, those are people. 
Those are Texans. Some of them want to be Texans. We're not just talking about numbers, but we've got to sum it up somehow. Like the state's economy, the workforce kind of moves along with it. Now, those lines aren't always in unison with each other. They are right now, but those lines aren't always in unison with one another. A lot of sort of interesting things happen economically. Remember, economics is basically this line that gets printed every day on this continuum. You want the line to start on the left, you want it to go to the right, and you want it to go from bottom to top every day. That's, that's how you want your line to look. If you've been looking at the stock market lately, you, you see how it looks when lines go from left to right, but go down. We don't want to see that. We don't want to see that with the economy. We don't see that with the workforce. It's a continuum, though. There's no, there's no uh, the, the economic term is stasis. Let's don't use that word. It doesn't sit still. It's always moving. Today is either going to be higher or lower than it was yesterday. That's just how it works. So if you look at it over the last 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years, you just see this graph that moves along. Remember, those are people. Now in Texas, over the last 10 years, our workforce chart has looked pretty good. We've typically finished a year with more people working in Texas than we started the year. That's where you want to be. It means we're growing. Companies are growing. New companies are being created. New employers have entered the state. But there's disruptions in that. There's, there's big disruptions at times. Hurricanes will disrupt a local economy. The COVID-19 pandemic will disrupt a state economy. And we tend to measure where we are with the workforce in terms of the last disruption. So a lot of the benchmarks that we're using right now, we tend to think in terms of pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. It is an economic measurement for us. So I will tell you that the pandemic effect on the economy ended actually some time ago. But I'm not talking about the health effects, I'm not talking about the healthcare effect, I'm not talking about any of that. I'm simply talking about the economy and where we are right now. We're back in a big growth period. In fact, our economy, at least as it concerns workforce, is growing rapidly. We, we're adding tens of thousands of jobs each month. In July, we completed a nine-month record-setting streak. So for the last nine months, we have set a new record for the number of people working in Texas each of those months. That's in the history of the state. At the same time, we're seeing our workforce participation rate come up. We're also seeing our civilian workforce numbers come up. We've seen unemployment benefits claims go way down. Like the last couple of weeks, uh, I think we're paying somewhere around 100 to 120,000 people, which is actually really low, just because there's always churn in the workforce. Different things are always happening. And so 100,000 people that are without work and probably didn't want to be, but the fact of the matter is that's not being caused by any kind of large factor. It's something specific to a company or maybe specific to someone's performance in the workplace. So we're adding tens of thousands of jobs a month. We're setting records. Workforce participation rate is up. Civilian workforce rate is up. The employment to population ratio is up. These are all very much signs of a growing economy. All of that is true. But when we look to the last big disruption in the economy, we, which is COVID, we see some things changed. And that's where we're really starting to find ourselves now, trying to figure out what those changes mean for the economy as a whole. Here's how I talk to you about it. All kinds of things happen relative to the workforce with regard to COVID. But if I boil it down to three things that I'm seeing specifically in the workforce right now, these are some things I think we should pay attention to in terms of how successful we're gonna be in the future of filling all these jobs. First thing I've noticed after COVID, there are a lot of new terms that we've gotten very comfortable with in the workforce, new terms. The one I like the least is called new normal. I'm gonna tell you why. There was no old normal, all right? There can't be a new normal if there was never an old normal. It wasn't normal, it just was. It was good in terms of growth, but we knew that there were some issues that we needed to address. What that new normal term really means is, is that we shine a spotlight on some things we knew about for some time, but now we actually have to do something about it. Other new terms, terms like AI. I came out of agriculture. AI means a certain thing in agriculture. It was confusing for me when a lot of people were talking about that. 
That was not how I learned it at Texas Tech. They meant artificial intelligence, right? SAS, SAS is a new term. SAS is what I get from my kids. Except no, it's software as a service, right? Clouds, I'm an ag guy. Clouds are good, we need rain. The drought monitor is too red. I would like to see less, I love red and black, but there's too much red on the drought monitor. So clouds are good, now that it's computing. This is where the SAS operates. You get the SAS from the clouds and the AI is what SASs you, all right? These tools are important, but it's changed the way we do work. In fact, it's changed the way people work entirely. It's even changed where they work. These new terms can be frightening because we're having to learn new things. But the fact of the matter is these new terms simply only describe new tactics that we've had to put into the workforce. These new tactics are described by the terms, but it's the tactics themselves that we need to understand. Why AI? Why SaaS? Why cloud? Because we approach things differently. The tools that we gained during COVID, these new tools that we gained during COVID are what we use to accomplish these new tactics. So what are some of these tactics? Well, you read a lot in the media about people just wanna work from home. We're gonna talk about that in just a minute because I need to come circle back around because I need to do a deep dive with you on that one. But that's not, that's not the entirety of the new tactics. Think about the shift that you've seen. You try to go to a bank lately, you gotta, you gotta make an appointment, and, and you'll go to the bank and they'll just flat tell you that there's a tool for that online. And you say, well, I didn't know we had that tool. And they say, well, we just added that tool. That is a new tactic. We're gonna do the work ourselves. We're gonna do a lot of the work ourselves because there's tools, technological tools, that help us do that. So a tactic might be, you know, we'll work where the customer is. That might be a new tactic. Or a tactic might be, I'll deploy um, more technology to solve problems that humans used to solve. And I think the concern for a lot of us is, is all right, if humans are being displaced by technology, what are the humans gonna do? And the fact of the matter is, there's a lot of jobs that humans can do. And these new tactics and the tools that come with them are really letting us look at the skills that people have and finding ways for those skills to add value to the workforce, whether at a small business like yours or even a large one. And I say it that way because you're in competition with every other employer, whether it's J.P. Morgan Chase or the guy next door to you. So I came up 34th earlier, just coming over here, taking the roundabout way. I mean, it's, it, it, honestly, it's amazing to see the locally owned businesses that are on 34th and 50th and all over town. You'll see that everywhere. It's a healthy economy. But these new tactics that we're using are disrupting the ways that people come to work. They're looking for different things. The tools, the new tools that we're using to power those tactics are kind of making some fundamental changes. I mentioned artificial intelligence. Does that sound like, at first I'm like, I don't even, like, I don't even know what that means. So I asked Siri, I said, hey Siri, um, what does it mean, like artificial intelligence? And she said, I don't know. She always says that. I'm gonna, let me do a Google search for you and stop asking me questions while you're driving. And, and so, she gives me this Google search and I realize, wait a minute, it is Siri. And that other one, A-L-E-X-A, -E you can't say her name because she, like she's always lurking. That, that is AI. We got one at TWC, his name's Larry, it's a better name. Larry the chatbot, that's what we call him. He answers questions. You know, one of the things we figured out during COVID is people ask the same question a lot. Millions of people were calling, they kept asking the same exact questions. So we taught Larry the chatbot how to answer those questions. And not this whole Siri thing where it's like, I'm gonna get you out of this web search. No, Larry, I'll just answer your question. No, Larry can do that because humans who knew the answers to the questions supplied Larry the information. Now, that was cool. 
because people didn't have to call. They could just get the answer and they could get on with what they needed to get on with. But what we didn't realize is, is the way they set Larry up, if Larry gets enough questions that he doesn't know the answer to, he sends us an email telling us that we, he doesn't have all the answers. And the next thing you know, you're talking to an inanimate object named Larry. Because Larry has needs. He wants to know the answers to the questions. Today, Larry answers somewhere between three and 400 questions. He does it in three languages, English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. And he's still pinging us when he's getting questions that he doesn't know the answer to. Now, they keep telling me over in the IT division, Larry is not, he's not alive. This is just how we program. And they keep telling me we can unprogram him anytime we're ready. I hope that's true. But right now, he's providing a useful service for us. Think about the way humans work. We don't have to meet in a room. It's better. This is pretty cool. We're all here learning something. But we got, to, we got tools, new tools, for a new tactic coming out of the pandemic. Zoom, Teams, WebEx, which is meet, like video conferencing. That's stressful, y'all. You gotta have picture day hair all the time. You gotta have Hollywood style lighting. If you don't have a cool computer generated background, you gotta like remodel your whole house so you can have an in-home studio. You gotta have the backgrounds because if you're in your car and you pull over at a state rest area, I, I, somebody told me this. You gotta throw up a background so they can't see that you're at Bahia State Park. You got different needs that you got. And people will call you on Zoom like it's a telephone. I miss telephones and emails that I can answer from wherever I am. But there's this need to get on the Zoom call. I bring that up because of this. Zoom is one of those things that I've been watching because Frankly, you see this all the time. We see it a lot in agriculture, where people start letting the tools they have determine the tactics that they're gonna use. I'm gonna do this because I have this. And that's backwards. Think about what you wanna do, then get the tools you need to do that thing. Don't let it be the other way around. We could have done this meeting by Zoom. Jarvis did a lot of these meetings by Zoom when he had to, but this is better. There's exchanges of ideas. There's crosstalk in the hallways. You meet cool people you wouldn't have met before. I call them sidebar conversations. We don't have those on Zoom. We have raise your hand virtually and somebody repeating over and over again, you're on mute. Here we have actual conversations and we trade ideas and we learn how people are doing things. Don't let the tools determine the tactics. Figure out what you wanna do and figure out what tools you need to do it because I think that's how you're gonna get things done. So, what tools? Oh, lots of tools. Now think about this. We're gonna figure out what we need. You're here for a reason. You came today to get information for a reason. And there's lots of good stuff. If you haven't made it over to the to the governor's small business team's portal, do that. You're gonna answer five or six really easy questions. It's gonna let you in. It's gonna open up this whole library of material for you, and that's just on the computer. They got real live humans over there that'll talk to you too and help you answer very specific questions about you and your business and how you might be able to get some things done. At some point, I feel certain, you're gonna talk about workforce and they're gonna refer you to the Workforce Commission. Someone from our Office of Employer Initiatives is gonna to talk to you about skills for small business, which is training funds. And they might talk to you a little bit about how you can plug into our workforce boards, the 28 of them, South Plains here in this area, and really get some hiring activities going on, whether it's one-on-one -on -one interviews at that site or workforce fair, those are tools. But only your tactics can determine which of those tools you can use. Honestly, there's some people waiting to help, but we're gonna wait on you. We do meetings like this one to raise awareness because I think it's pretty useful. It's been tough to hire people lately. It's because everybody's doing it, quite frankly. The media got a hold of it about a year ago. They call it the great resignation. It's not correct. They didn't read the whole report. 
There was a second page. People left their jobs to go do another job. Post-COVID, hiring took a huge upward turn. So if our curve was like this before, our curve looks more like this now. You're seeing it backwards, it goes up. Because more people are hiring, because there's a need for more people. We look at 11 major industry sectors in the state when we look at employment data. Eight of the 11 are larger than they were before COVID. Six of the 11 are as large as they've ever been. They are gaining employees at a rate we really haven't seen before. And it, it's because people are hiring in all sectors. And at this point, I'm, I'm trying to keep the economic stuff to a minimum. At this point, it's organic growth. These sectors are growing. There are, in this town, in my town, in any other number of towns in this state, there are signs up in almost every retail establishment, whether it's restaurant, retail sales, et cetera, saying they need help. There's this presumption that that industry is not growing. No, it's actually one of the eight that has grown beyond its where it was pre-COVID. The hospitality retail sales sector is, is actually much larger than it was pre-COVID. The reason why we still need people is because it's growing that much. So where do people go? Well, COVID was disruptive. That's an hour long seminar, so we don't have time for that today. Those jobs were all hired back uh, by November of last year. So not those specific jobs, but the number of jobs in the economy. We were back to our pre-COVID, we set a record right before COVID in February. We exceeded that in November of last year. So everything we've seen since November is just more growth stacked on top of that. In what sectors? Well, all except for oil and gas and government jobs. Those are the two uh, that really haven't recovered yet. The other one's called other sectors. It's like a catch-all where we don't know where to put you. And so everybody's competing for the same employees. You're deploying new tactics, you have new tools, but fundamentally you gotta get to those employees. The media talks about this great resignation sort of ignoring the fact that people didn't leave their jobs just to stop working. They went to a new job. Number one reason why they went to a new job? Does anybody know what that is? I know, so if you don't, I'll tell you. Yeah. It's actually knowing that there's upward trajectory at the place that they work. It's a weird way to say it. It's the way it was phrased in the poll. What it means is this. I do a thing for you, but I want to know somewhere in my heart that I'm not gonna do the same thing for you for the next 30 years. I wanna know that I'm gonna get promoted. I wanna know that I might get a raise. I wanna know that I might get a bonus. I wanna know that five years from now, I know more than I know today. Number two on the list, reason why people left one job to go to another, thus contributing to the great resignation, great reallocation, it's got a thousand names. Number two on the list was just total compensation. Now, is that shocking? If you're presented with two jobs and one pays $50,000 and one pays $65,000 and they're relatively the same, tell me about your decision-making process on that. Makes sense to me too. Number three on the list. Number three on the list was essentially to the effect of I want to know that my work is meaningful. Like, I don't want busy work. I want to know that what I'm doing makes a difference. Number four on the list was workplace flexibility. Number five on the list was, um, frankly, I never should have entered this field in the first place, and I need to be in a completely different field. It's like the dental hygienist that wakes up one day and thinks, you know, I work with my fingers in people's mouth all day. I think I'd really rather be an oil-filled roughneck, and there's an opportunity for you if you're interested in that. I can talk to you about that after the thing. We don't have a lot of dental hygienists that move to the oil field, but they could, that's my point, here, because there's tools for them too. Now, if you stop and think about it, if it's, I want, I want to know that I have upward trajectory in the workforce and I wanna know that my work is meaningful and I wanna know that I'm adequately compensated for that, on the employer side, what are they looking for? You're the employers, you know. People who know what they're doing and can get some stuff done. But they don't come ready to go out of the carton. You have a unique way you do things at your business. They will come with basic skills, but you're going to have to fine tune those skills. 
And I think that's where some places like the Workforce Commission and others can help. When we look at the movement of people in the workforce, what we're seeing is, is that employers are getting incredibly more focused on the skills, not the credentials. Meaning, they don't necessarily care what degree you have, but what skills does that degree mean that you can do? And here's another interesting thing. When we get the focus on skills, we're gonna worry a lot less about what the credentials say, just whether or not those credentials mean we have the skills. Now think about it like this. About 35% of the jobs in this state require a college degree and about 35% of the workforce has a college degree. That worked out pretty good. About 8% of the jobs in this state are what we would call unskilled entry-level workforce, meaning you don't even have to have a college or a high school diploma. You, know, you certainly didn't go to college. You probably didn't even graduate high school. Maybe you have a GED. It's about 8% of the jobs in this state, about 18% of the workforce has no training after high school whatsoever. Okay, so there's 10% more people at the unskilled entry-level labor position than we need. And then the big middle, 54% of the jobs in this state are what we call middle skills jobs. They require some training after high school. They don't require a complete college degree. And about 34 or 5% of Texans have that set of skills. These are middle skills jobs, but they can often be high wage. Have you had a plumber lately work at your house? An electrician? A welder? Have you ever needed a nurse? Have you ever worked with a nurse? Patient care technician? These jobs can be financially rewarding and there's certainly upside potential for them, but people need to see the career path. You say, hey Brian, bro, I'm a, I'm a small business. Like, I'm, like I don't have this you know, great sort of career track for people. Yes, you do. Yes, you do, because as they grow, they're more valuable for your business. If you could find a program that helped you train them, either through your local workforce board or something, the workforce commission, or even your local community college, you could make them more valuable to you with that training, but then they're more valuable to themselves as well. Well, Brian, that's just gonna drive wages up. Well, I think this is probably the worst message I have to deliver today. That's why growing people up, coaching them up in-house, it builds some loyalty. It may necessitate a raise. Not, not in the beginning. They'll gain value to the workplace as they go. But sooner or later, if you don't give them that raise, somebody else is gonna figure out what you've done. And so you work with people. It's about humans. It's about people. We form those relationships. We help them get that meaningful work that they're looking for, and we help them really understand that there's value to what they do and how they can move themselves up into the workforce. And we find ways to get them the compensation that they're looking for. It's not easy. It's not easy. I, I boiled it down to you know, 15, 20 minutes here today. Everything I'm saying is absolutely true, but we haven't started the hard work yet. But we will, and there's people that wanna help you. The tactics, they're all the same. The tools, they're gonna to be different depending on what your tactic is. But there's a whole bunch of people that are willing to invest in what you're doing, sometimes financially, and sometimes just making sure that you have the very best people that you need. It's pretty exciting. It's a great time to be in Texas. It's a phenomenal time to be in business in Texas. It is not easy. But you're talking about real heroes. People who start their own business, that's real heroes, folks. It's like, you know, we, we think about the, all the, the Spanish explorers that got in their ship and they sailed over here and they staked out the whole plains and, 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 and then they went back to Spain and they talked all about it. We think that takes courage. Quitting your nine to five to start your own business when you got mouths to feed, including yours, that's courage. That's the kind of strength that makes this state what it is today. So from me to you, and all the people I work with, thanks for doing what you do. You make this state a great place to be. Thanks for having me out today. Thanks for coming out and really learning about some things where we can make this state better. I'm proud to be a Texan, I know you are too, and really looking forward to working with each of you as we move into this future of Texas. Thank you.
Thank you, Chairman Daniel. And if we could just have one more round of applause for all of our speakers today and our sponsors and partners. I just want to remind everyone before we conclude the event, there will be a survey that's going out. If you see that come in, please take a few moments to fill that out for us. It really helps us tailor um, these workshops to where they will be useful going forward. And we're hopeful that you found some good information today and made some good contacts. And ladies and gentlemen, um, also don't forget our small business portal. Um, that was mentioned earlier as well. Right there, sorry I jumped ahead a slide, but um, you can go on there and it's a great tool that we're trying to push out. You can go onto that portal, answer a few questions, and it will actually pull up uh, the resources that are available to you in your region. So it's a great tool I wanted you to be aware of. And then let me go back to the small business team. Jarvis, Brian, and Jack are um, on our small business team out of Austin. They're the ones that helped um, organize this and put this together. And they are also available for you as small businesses if you have questions or need assistance. Um, we're all available, so I just wanna stress that to, to never hesitate to reach out to us. Um, as you're leaving today, make sure you grab a business card or meet some of us and we're happy to help you in any way we can. So with that, that is going to conclude our, our Governor's Small Business Series Conference, and we really want to thank you for spending time with us today. It's hard to get away from your businesses. You're pulled in a lot of different directions, so we appreciate that you spent the time here today, and we hope that you will walk out of here with some tools and contacts that'll make you successful in growing your business, and we appreciate you and wish you the best of luck. So thank you again.